I'll introduce the subjects in uh, this course, Environmental Engineering in Developing Countries. And uh, the course has a focus on the rural areas, as it's mentioned here. I'll just start with a little bit of um, a definition here. Developing countries, what is that? Uh, from Taken from Wikipedia, uh, it is nations with the lowest standard of living, underdeveloped, industrial base and low human development index relative to other countries. There is as many definitions as uh, you find people who are trying to define it if they should make up their own. But basically, it is a lot of those countries in this area and um, uh, more or less uh, this area that has, say, a lot of people with a lot of, large part of the population with a low living standard in one way or another. If we look at the world map in a bit other way, where it's depicted like the, the wealth, the size of the language, the size of the country is uh, depicting the total wealth of that country. The world looks a bit, little bit different. As you can see, Europe gets very big we're very rich. This is the, say, the, the wealth times the population here. Uh, United States is very big. Japan is suddenly very big. Also, China and India appear quite big. It's not because they are very rich, but it's because they have a lot of people living in very small, uh, relative to the size uh, right now. As you can see, Africa has absolutely uh, no extension. There's very poor. South America is very poor. Rest of Asia is uh, so and so. Many countries are very small here. There's a little bit of hope uh, that uh, it's going in a better direction. If we look at the growth uh, between 2010 and 2015, we can see there, there are uh, still a lot of growth in uh, China, India. Uh, as you may know, we still have a lot of growth in Europe, United States. Uh, there is more growth than, than wealth in uh, South America and also in, in, in some African countries, at least. There are some African countries which are growing, but it's from a very uh, low level. So that is the developing countries. The other part of the name of this course is environmental engineering. Uh, I also looked it up in, uh, in Wikipedia. So it says here it's the science of engineering and engineering principles to improve the natural environment provides water, air, land for human uh, habitation, other organisms to clean up pollution sites. It's, uh, it's true. It's very much about the constructions, constructed things, part of environment. But I found an even uh, more uh, precise definition that we could use in this course on the homepage of the institute here. I have not had nothing to do with the writing it, but it's uh, very good. Uh, the description of the Master of uh, Studies in Environmental Engineering says that it's about sustainable solutions to complex environmental problems, which while taking into account social, legal, economic, and resource issues. And this is very much what we are going to talk about in this course and work with, to make solutions that are sustainable, uh, not only in terms of the technical things, uh, being able to work, but definitely in that they are able to work in the society uh, where it's placed with the people that are going to use it. Uh, legally, it may not be a word we are thinking a lot on, but the, in the third week where we are writing um, application, uh, we are focusing on the um, advocacy because people have a right to have a decent environment to live in. So uh, it's also legal is, is very much underlying uh, the, the reasons that we can ask for and why we're working with uh, environmental improvements in developing countries. Economics is definitely something that we have to look a lot on. We are working in uh, poor societies, as I said, so, so we have to find solutions that are, are viable for that. And uh, the resources um, available, local materials, also people's uh, resources. So that's what it's about here. Let's take a look at uh, what it's like in, to live in those uh, countries. Here's a picture from South Africa, uh, where, um, which is a 
developing country in some senses, but it's uh, getting richer. It's a, it's a rich developing country, as you can say, but with a large part of the population who are still very poor. But as you see, very nice road, nice houses. Could be Denmark, uh, in, in a sense. Um, in, if you look at the standard of living in this, this road here, the neighboring country, Botswana, it's also, in, uh, on average, a very rich country because they have diamonds, and, but it's a very small part of the population who, are, who is very rich and a large part who is poor. <laughs> but they have a nice uh, shopping mall here. Could also feel there for some time that it's very much like in Denmark. But this is in the, say, central parts, in the established part of the cities that it looks like this. In the outskirts of any, any city in developing countries, there's something you can call uh, the peri-urban areas, which is very much uh, slum areas, like, like this one in South Africa. You can see people living in shacks, very, very, very close to each other, probably uh, renting shacks. Somebody, even on a low level, is earning money on renting these places out. And um, very poor uh, living conditions, as you can imagine here. You can see the houses are made of uh, just about anything that you can find uh, to to um, which is free. Uh, a lot of these houses are built absolutely without money, uh, though some have a roof and and so on. And the family may look like this. And um, you could ask why why do they live there? Why do they they probably moved in from the countryside to peri up an area to a very a um, place like that. Would you have any explanation on why they would be doing that instead of living in the countryside? That's yeah. where they have the network and they have some job opportunities that are promised maybe and not delivered. It, yeah, especially the last part, the job opportunities, not always uh, delivered, not always, um, they don't always get what they can, but they still, they come there to look for jobs and for content in the life, I think. It can be a bit boring maybe to live in the countryside where nothing is developing, everybody is just doing like their grandparents. So they come to the city to seek uh, a better life. And even though we may say that there's, it's a very indecent life because everything is so uh, dirty and poor and, and everything, they still go there. And a few years ago, I think five years ago or something, I remember the the number of people who lived in cities uh, is now higher than the, the number of people living in rural areas. It was the opposite until five years ago. So there's a very clear move uh, to, to the city because people find that it's better. If we look at, um, if we move away from the city, it may look like this. This is from India, very simple hut, made from absolutely no money. Uh, could be they paid for a little bit for some bamboo or, or anything, but it's really just mud and uh, cow dung mixed together, put on some branches, make a, 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 a you know a structure of uh, branches, uh, bamboo, whatever available there, and then covered with mud, kept very nice and clean. Here is the rice they have. Um, um, milled and collected on the fields and now it's drying in the sun and so on on, on the mud but it's very kept uh, dry and clean here very poor living conditions what would they be doing they could be doing I mean in their daily life what would be their job this uh, woman here her job is to look after the household so she could for example be going to uh, wherever she has a water source. Uh, here is a broken uh, water supply system where she can wash her clothes. So she's using the opportunity to, for doing that. That's if you're a woman. If you're a man, what will you be doing? Probably you would be playing cards or you would be looking at someone playing cards. And this is very much the structure, uh, unfortunately, in uh, many developing countries. This is in India, but it could also have been in Africa. Not that it's totally like that, but it's very much like that. The women are very hardworking at home. Uh, the men are sometimes hardworking uh, outside if they can give it, get a job. But as you said, it's not always easy to get a job. 
A uh, little bit more higher level here. I'm just taking very, very scanty examples to show you that the world is a little bit uh, different uh, from where you go. Malawi, it's a poorer country, but here's an example of a house that seems to be a little bit better than the one we saw before. It's built of bricks, but these bricks are, are locally made in the village. They are burning, that they are collecting this, the soil. They have a very clay soil, so they are putting it on in a big bunch, and then they are, they are putting fire on it, so they get some bricks that are not the best quality, but something that looks like the bricks we are using here in, uh, in Denmark, for example. So they have some quite nice and uh, stable houses in uh, Malawi. What would they be doing in their daily life? They would some of them be fetching water from the standpost. They have very little water. It's a very dry area, and uh, this standpost may be may be serving the uh, a whole village or three villages. Um, it was installed by the Danish Red Cross, and um, people had to walk a long way. But that was their best uh, water source here. But in the rural areas, it can also look like this. This is an example from Vietnam, where people with a bit more money have built a very nice house. Now it starts to look like uh, the one I showed from South Africa or Denmark here. Uh, they're, they're paying in Vietnam according to the, the length of the front of the house. So they're building very narrow ho houses. Um, they're paying some tax according to the, to the, the length of the house. So they're building high and they're building towards the back here. And they're waiting for a neighbor, apparently, here to, to build a similar house uh, beside them. What would they be doing? They would be, uh, for example, going to the fields. Uh, they have a rice field. Everyone has a rice field in, uh, in rural area in, in Vietnam. And here they are replanting the rice. First they plant it in a uh, very, very close. And then when it gets bigger, they, they move it by hand in the, into the uh, big fields here. So uh, these are some examples of, uh, say, living conditions, some places in the world. It's very, very different within a country, within a village. Um, but these are some examples here. Um, this course is looking at how to, um, how to support improvements in life conditions, you could say. And um, if we look at how it is decided what projects to make, what to support with development aid. For a long time, the development agenda has been based on what is called the Millennium Development Goals. In uh, around 2000, uh, the United Nations, uh, all countries in the world, they set up some goals, um, which were eight different goals that they said, this is what we're going to improve for every poor country, at least uh, every country in the world, for the world as such. First is to ex uh, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Second one, to achieve universal primary uh, education. Uh, third one is to promote... Uh, gender equality and empower the women, especially power of women. Fourth is to reduce child mortality. That is the uh, children. A lot of children is dying because of diseases, because of uh, before they before they are uh, even five years old in some countries. Um, improve maternal health. That is about uh, giving birth. Is also something that kills a lot of women uh, because the birth is given under difficult condition, and if something goes wrong, um, they can easily die. Um, sixth one is to combat HIV and AIDS on, and malaria and some other diseases. And uh, the seventh is to ensure the environmental sustainability. And this eighth one is the Global Partnership for Development. That is to work together, that we wanted to establish some some uh, collaboration between richer countries and poorer countries or between poorer countries so they can develop uh, together. So these were some overall uh, goals that were set. Under each goal, there were some targets and, and especially one of the targets, I think there was ah, maybe 18 in, in total. One of the targets uh, that we're going to look a lot on and that has been very much uh, determining the development in 
in in this area of environmental engineering is that they said that by 2015 we're going to half the proportion of people without sustainable access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. So they looked at, let's say, 40% in a, uh, has no access to water supply and sanitation. So in 2015, it should be only 10 to 20%. And they took the, the reference year was uh, 1990, even though it was decided in 2000. So I've been telling this story for many years about this is our goals, but as you see, 2015, now we're at the end, so uh, no more to do, or what, we don't know. Uh, we'll see it a little bit later how far we got with the, some of those goals here, but um, we have to get a new uh, agenda, uh, because this has been the agenda until now, all, almost all the, the targets that were set about education and, and all that was set for 2015. So it is about, we are in a, in a time where things have to change somehow. At the end of the presentation here, I'll get back to some of the thoughts because it's not very clear what's going to happen now, but uh, I'll end the presentation today with um, um, telling about what is some of the considerations that is being done right now. Until now, uh, they have been publishing the the progress of uh, the Millennium Development Goals in some different reports here. Uh, the United Nations has uh, the Millennium Development Goals report every year. They are trying to summarize all the eight goals and all the targets. There's a special one which is very interesting. I think you should uh, look into it here uh, during this course. There's a lot of good statistics specifically about water supply and sanitation and something about hygiene. And uh, this is from the World Health Organization and UNICEF. They are called the um, Joint uh, Evaluation, no, some Joint Monitoring Program, JMP. Uh, so they're, wa they're watching particularly on water supply and sanitation. There's another report here which is much broader. It's not really uh, related to the Millennium Development Goals, but it's a human development report that is every year trying to summarize how, how well is uh, countries uh, developing. They're looking at very broad uh, issues, also human rights and, and access to jobs and whatever, into a, uh, trying to form the Human Development Index, for example. And they're every year um, taking a new, um, a new uh, topic there or a new angle to, to this. Uh, the last one here is about uh, reducing vulnerabilities and building resilience. It is very much uh, because there's a lot of focus nowadays on uh, disasters. We're getting disasters from, uh, from the changing climate, for example, which is going to enhance the disasters like floods and... Uh, earthquakes and all these things. Um, so they are taking a specific focus on that because this is very much on the agenda uh, these years here. So this course here is focusing on three things mainly. Uh, wash. Wash is a good word. It means water supply, sanitation, and personal hygiene. It's very short for that. If you want and... and um, Wash is something that guarantees you a good health in terms of what we call the water-related diseases. You will hear a lot about it tomorrow, uh, the water-related diseases here. We're also focusing in this course in, uh, on the rural areas in developing countries. Uh, not that it cannot be used, because it can in, in, in other areas also. But the cases we're working with is uh, rural areas. So... Um, you could ask yourself, why is it important to improve the wash? Maybe, do you have any any ideas to why it's important about water sanitation, hygiene? Yeah. Reduce some sicknesses. Reduce some sicknesses, yeah. I mentioned the water-related diseases that it can reduce. Yeah. Would there be other reasons to look into this area? Yeah? It also can lead to sanitation, which is still very much in the 
Yeah. yeah. Both the water supply and sanitation and hygiene is very much contributing to. If it's not, if you don't have clean water, if you don't have enough water, if you don't have sanitation, if you're not washing your hands, you, you may get these water-related diseases. So altogether is contributing to a better health. Would there be other things than health that is, uh, would be a good uh, reason to work with these things? Yeah. Still, I think maybe having a good water supply, yeah. uh, perhaps nearby, you would save a lot of well, people living in that community would save a lot of time that could be working or living mm -hmm. or being put to use some other way rather than having to uh, Yeah. So you could increase the production and the time for other relevant activities education. education yeah you would probably have more girls going to school yeah these are some of the um, important ones I listed some uh, ideas here uh, I could also say to live a decently in a clean environment is something that everyone would would like to do the water related diseases was mentioned here we have diarrhea worms malaria some examples you will hear a lot more tomorrow Reduced child mortality, uh, that was one of the other goals in uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it's diseases that they are dying off, but it's definitely when we make better water supply sanitation, we'll have less children dying. As it was mentioned, increase the productivity um, to decrease the illiteracy that we, girls will have time to go to school instead of fetching water. Um, to increase gender equality, it's very much women who are um, managing the water and um, that could be improved if uh, they didn't have to spend so much time on that, then the women would have time to, to participate in other production and things. And then, uh, yeah, basically it's, a, it's an important foundation for any, any progress that you can reduce and uh, diseases and people's time to do other things. So there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Let's start with the <clears throat> start with the um, the personal hygiene. Uh, washing hands this is a picture from uh, Cambodia where a woman is uh, washing her hands. Um, she doesn't have a tap uh, because the water is limited, so she would have some kind of other water source. So she's washing it from the uh, this small uh, jar here. Another example is from a school in uh, in Ghana, where school children are, are fetching the water from a, from a hand pump nearby, and then they uh, everybody can line up and wash their hands. So that, but it's not something that happens everywhere. If we look at some statistics, this is not very well documented because it's difficult really to document if people are actually washing hands. Not something you can go and count the hand pumps or count the toilets and so on. But uh, with this uh, very um, on, uh, difficult to read, there's some countries in Africa here mentioned, and the um, it's for the poorest people, uh, and for the richest people is, is the, the red one here, and, and the others are in between. So this, it's the 20% fractiles. You can see richest people, they wash more hands in, in any, any of the country. Um, you can also see there's a bit big difference between countries, uh, not a clear uh, correlation, but you could say richer countries have a little bit better hand washing than the um, the other one. This is the proportion of households with uh, what's it say with place for hand washing uh, with water and soap. So. Um, you can see a lot of those are, even for the richest people, a lot below 50% uh, of the people washing hands. So it sounds very poor. There's a reason it's, it's difficult to, to say, give a precise num number, because it depends on when you're washing hands. I could ask you, for example, if you could raise your hand. How many here is washing hands after going to the toilet? A lot. How many are washing hands before cooking? 
also like everyone. How many are washing hands before eating? Uh, less, less, less. Okay, I was expecting that uh, you would lie to me, but maybe you're not. You're quite uh, true here. We don't all do it, and I notice in, in uh, and when I go to the canteen here, you, you can see, I mean, everybody's just going in, buying their food. Nobody's going to the toilet before that. Uh, it's very easy to see here, at least at lunchtime, nobody, very few people wash their hands. Even, actually, if you look at the, after going to the toilet, they, they once in the, um, uh, in the London School of Hygiene is really the place for, for hygiene. Uh, they put up some small webcams in the, in the toilets, and they saw that uh, at least 30% was not washing hands after the toilets in that place. So it's not something, I mean, there's a lot of education, a lot of getting used to, to, to doing uh, things, and uh, it's difficult to measure, but it's very, very important, very important for the uh, prevention of diseases here. A little bit of statistics for water supply here. Um, if we look at how it's going, according to the goals that were set uh, for 2015, we can see that globally, already in 2012, uh, the target was uh, reached. We have a Millennium Development Goal was the target that 88% has access to either piped water, that is the blue one, and or other improved water sources. I'll show you some examples of what is improved and what is not improved. And then still in 2012, 9% um, had, say, unimproved. They have some kind of uh, water supply, but it's not it improved. And then the worst kind is the surface water, people using surface water. That was only 2% of the world population. So that looks good. However, if we look at the different countries here, there's a bit of a discrepancy around the world. We can see the blue areas is the where more than 90% has access to improved water supply. Um, improved means nearby and, and, um, and clean water. Uh, the, yet the, the light blue is the places where they have um, um, between 76 and 90%. Yellow is between 50 and 75 and the orange ones are less than 50% has access to clean water. And it's very obvious that uh, it's in Africa generally. I wouldn't even say Sub-Saharan Africa, but in Africa generally it's not uh, that well. Most of Africa is uh, less, less than 75% has access. And in some countries it's even uh, less than 50%. I have a question. Yes? Uh, is this, how is this um, surface water, is that really a good measure of water quality? Because, I mean, in a place like Mongolia, you could, mm. uh, like, imagine people having access to, like, a mountain lake or something. Yes. Yeah. That would be absolutely clear water, mm. but not uh, with the least standard. Ah, no, it's a good question. I mean, surface water is not necessarily uh, polluted. It's very much about whether there's humans who have polluted it. It can also be animal pollution, but it's mostly human you're, that you're afraid of because you transfer diseases from one human, and especially from the feces, there's a lot of diseases that are transferred uh, from that. So if someone has access to the water and, and polluted, it, then it's not. And that is the general case. But if, as you say, in the mountains, you find... Uh, uh, rivers that come directly from the mountains, from springs, and that are very clean. So that uh, could be. And, and by definition, this is not clean because it's surface water. And there are some things in the definitions uh, that are not very clear, but they, but they have to be, I think, kind, kind of stringent in, in the definition. So, But I would say it's probably the fewest people who have access to in some, uh, to, to running water, to, uh, to surface water that is clean. But people in mountains do have, and that may be a very good water source. If we look at those country by country, who is on track to reach the Millennium Development Goal? So either you have already met the target, that's the blue one, um, 
or you are on track to meet it. This, the, the numbers is from 2012. So there's a bit of delay in the in the results here. So from 2012, um, you could see that that some are on track. They would reach their, their goal, their target uh, of reducing to only half of the population who has not access. Um, but some are not on track. And again, uh, a lot of Africa is not on track. Um, but uh, and a few middle uh, Asian countries is also not on track here. There's a bit of difference between uh, urban and rural access to clean water. You can see the, the slopes here that the urban population is growing a lot. Rural population is not growing very much. You can also see that the piped water is very much to, in the urban areas and, um, and the not much more than the rural areas. So generally in rural areas, the, the conditions are, are quite poorer than in the urban areas. Some examples here. When we talk about surface water, it's not the clean water you mentioned uh, in, the, in the mountains. This is a, a lake formed by the rainwater uh, and it can stay for a long time, even in the dry season here. So this is what those people in northern Ghana, they have the possibility to, to fetch their water. They are walking into the water uh, to, to take um, the water, even watering their animals in the same water. So you can imagine it's very uh, dirty here. In West Bengal and, and, and Bangladesh, um, they have a lot of water, a lot of surface water, and they're keeping it in, in ponds where they are um, using those pond water for everything. They are also washing, here they're washing their utensils. They are using it for fish breeding. They are watering their animals. They are bathing in it. Um, a lot of the places where they have just a bit of money, they have established uh, hand pumps because it's also very cheap because the water is so easily accessible. So most people are not drinking that water actually, and which helps a lot on the health. Uh, but they also have a lot of surface water here. Here you see people, um, women, uh, carrying the water in Malawi. Um, it's also to say that the it's not just the quality of the water, it's also the amount of water. If you want water for washing the hands, if you want to wash your hands, you need water. And when you have to carry water home and it takes half an hour, you, you don't carry so much. Uh, you cannot, it, it's, I mean, it's just too much work. So you carry only just what is necessary. And therefore, it's very difficult to keep up a good hygiene when, you have, where you, when you're in an area with, where you have to carry the water home here. Uh, here's some um, uh, um, statistics on who is it actually carrying the water. As you can see, 62% is women, 9% is girls, 23% is men, and 6% is, is boys. It's very much a, a woman thing <clears throat> about fetching water. What we saw before was all the poor water quality. This is the acceptable water quality. This is what they call improved water supply. A uh, hand pump is taking water from the, from the ground and which is water has been filtered and is free from bacteria. Generally, a hand pump is giving uh, clean water, though there can be some chemical substances like fluoride and arsenic in, in, in the water. But generally, this is free from bacteria. <coughs> a little bit more simple is to dig a hole uh, to make a well, uh, what we call a dock well. You dig it with a, with a shovel. If it has been improved with cement uh, on the sides and, and um, making sure nobody is coming into it. This one even has a lid and just a hole to put down your bucket and you, you have a, a nice protection around it and so on. Then you consider that water is also quite clean. It's not that polluted because people cannot get into it and, and pollute it. And the best one is, it's not the very best one, but this is a tap where you can also Typically, it would be uh, you would get it from groundwater or spring water, clean water that you're distributing in in um, in taps uh, where people are, are fetching it. So th this is a very good water quality, also considered uh, improved water supply. If it was at home, it would be even uh, better. But this is among the good ones. Sanitation, on the other hand, that is a bit more sad story. We're not on track. 
the goal will not be reached in 2015 is very clear here. We, uh, in, the, in this figure here, they're saying from 1990 to 2012, um, they're looking at four types of sanitation. Uh, the green one here is the improved sanitation. That is good sanitation. Get back to what that is. Uh, the light green one is shared sanitation. That means several families are sharing the same toilet. Uh, could also be public uh, public latrines. This is not considered uh, adequate sanitation. Uh, then you have some things called unimproved, where it's not uh, very clean. You have your own toilet, but it's not a very clean toilet, where you could also um, uh, transfer diseases because it's not clean. And then you have open defecation. That means you have no toilet. So open defecation means you go to the bushes. And as you see here in 2012, we should the green one should have reached uh, that 75%, but it's not going to do it in 2015. And if we look at the world map, a few more countries is now uh, added on the list here, on the poor list. Red one is the place where less than 50% has access to uh, a good sanitation. And the yellow one is where between only between 50 and 75, so less than 75% has uh, access to it. And that involves a lot like uh, China and Russia, uh, Mongolia here. And you can see India fell down into the, into the um, red um, group. Uh, and that means, you know, I'll show you another statistic. India is the country that has most uh, people not with adequate sanitation here. So looking at who is on track, who will reach the goals? Uh, again, lots more or less the same countries will not uh, reach their goals here. China is, which was before, I mean, it's still under 75%, but especially the last uh, few years, they have really intensified their, their campaign. So uh, now they're reaching at least their goals, but they could be their goal was low. I don't remember that. Uh, again, there's a difference between uh, rural and urban areas. A lot better conditions in urban areas than in, in the rural areas. And if you look at the absolute number of people, here we're looking at open defecation only. Um, so that is the worst group where people have no toilet at all. Um, the, if we look at the total number of people, uh, that has no access. Then we, this figure shows that more than half of the people in the world who has, who is practicing open defecation, who has no toilet, not using a toilet, is in India. So because there are so many people and because conditions are, are very uh, poor, even though it's uh, in many ways India is a very, uh, in some places it's quite developed and they. Uh, uh, doing some very uh, good things. But in terms of getting the whole population raised, they're not very good at that. So a few people, few countries here, 10 countries, are, are covering more than uh, 82 is 82 percent of the people who are not here. I yes? I, mean, I, I can see why it's an issue in India because it's so densely populated. Yes. But a place like Nigeria, say, isn't it okay to poop in a bush because there's plenty of space? Mm. You can always find another bush. So. Ah, you could say so that in places where there is few people and a lot of space, that that would be better. Uh, and it could be in a, in a certain situation maybe the best option for a short period. But people tend to go to the same area. It's it's because it's. Uh, it's, some, it's a bit shameful, this, about going to the toilet, where you don't used to do it together. Women often go to the toilet together, but I don't, see, I don't think they go and shit together. Uh, they, but so, it's, uh, so people tend to go to the same places, a bit away from, from sight, people where, where, where you don't look or something like that. The risk would definitely be higher there anyway. I mean, if you go and... Uh, shit in the bushes where other people are also around. The risk is at least uh, higher. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, one of the things that is mentioned is the rapes, the, the fear of rapes and the risk of being raped when you go to the bushes. That is actually a, a very good uh, reason, a very good uh, way where you can convince people that it's a good idea that they get themselves a, a toilet. Uh, what was the other thing you said? Rape? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they try to avoid going to the toilet until it's very necessary. It's a uh, violence. Rape is a is a big issue when when women are going to to the bushes. Yes. I know that uh, because it's a shameful thing, people tend to when they can try to go to the river or the mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a problem if 200 meters further down the Yeah, yes. So you pollute the, the, the rivers because it's nice to sit by the river and, and you have the feeling that it's taking it away, but then you others are being... Um, I think this is a, even a, a, a bigger problem with it when it comes to wastewater because a lot of wastewater from a city is also let into a river. If it's not near the sea, then you lead it to, the, to a river. And then it is, can pollute a lot uh, of water. Definitely right. A few pictures of uh, sanitation options here. As I said, you can go to the fields, you can go to the uh, bushes, to the forest. Usually uh, villages have some different places where people used to go. So they, then you take care. When you ask people to show, you know, how... Make a, I've seen theater a couple of times where people are showing, you know, the situation where you go and look for a place to sit when you go and try to find out not to step in uh, any fresh, you know, it's, or something is very, very funny to look at and very funny to put into their place here. It's a big issue, something people think a lot about here. Here's the example you mentioned, uh, the rivers. Here it's in India, it's in, even institutionalized. It's called the river latrine. It is built, so you walk here on, on, on this, and then the dropping just goes down into the river behind here. So it could just be a big branch, some places, and a piece of uh, clothes. Then you have a toilet. Very simple, very cheap, very disgusting. This is a public latrine in Ghana, uh, in a village, uh, with four, uh, four or five um, rooms. And um, it can be very nice and clean, but it's not considered uh, a adequate sanitation because uh, you, you cannot ensure that people are using it. it it's, if there's many that are sharing it, then it might not be cleaned. Nobody knows who is going to clean it and, and so on. So by definition, uh, it has been said that this is not adequate. And, uh, but this is something that is being uh, changed a bit. The view of this, after all these years of uh, experience, uh, UN, uh, WHO is changing their view on, on this. So still, looking at, um, you're looking at the, the sanitation ladder. You want to get people started to use a toilet, getting away from the bushes and then starting using toilets. And then it's better that they use a shared first and then maybe they develop the needs, the wish to have a, their own private latrine. So that could be even better later on. This is a good latrine. This is a VIP. It's not for very important persons, but it's a ventilated, improved pit latrine. It has a chimney that takes the smell away. It is just a hole in the ground. You can say, or that's a big box down here. This is the same toilet seen from, from the side where you enter. So down here is the shit. It's easy to empty because it's on a hill. It's in a slum area, this one. And uh, it's very nice because of the, it's not smelling as much as the, the ones with them, um, which has no chimney. Yeah? Where do they take the shit? Uh, they would take it to a septic pit somewhere far away. They have a big pit where they unload it, if they do it. So no Sometimes, cheating. pardon? There's no cleaning, you just... If you, if you have several pits, you could let it clean by itself. 
Uh, you could also, I mean, there are uh, innovative ways where you can mix it also with uh, with uh, um, garden material and, and so on. You can compost it and after some time all the bacteria will be dead. So if you if you have set up the system and make it work, but it's very, it's difficult typically. In some countries like China and, and Vietnam, they have a very long tradition of, of doing it. They're very good at, at reusing the, so you can reuse the uh, nutrients from the from the from the feces, but um, normally it is not done. So the idea is you take it out, you throw it away, and you leave it there for some years and or a year, and then it would be okay to use for anything else. But sometimes they have not even thought about it. I mean, they dig the hole, they put the slab here. In this case, it's a little bit, uh, it's with water. This, it has a water seal, like the toilets that we're using here. Um, there's a small water seal beneath. It's not nothing more than a, than a, than a slab, a plate of cement. But below this plate, there's, there's this water seal, so the, the smell cannot get, get through the, the water. Water is sealing this, the smell away. So it's easier to keep clean. And in some countries, they, they like to have it like this. And I think in, it's a development also with those using dry latrines, mm -hmm. the, like the ones we saw before with the chimney. It's just a hole in the ground. Uh, people are used to that in Africa, most of Africa. But in India, they see this as the, the right way, uh, the right uh, toilet to use. It's very much about culture and what people are used to. It doesn't make a big difference in the in the hygiene here. And this is the even more, um, this, the other one was cast in cement, so it's not as, uh, not as uh, smooth as this one. This is in porcelain from a uh, case from Vietnam. And this is what, now we are at the level of, of our own uh, latrines. But some, some latrines are raised like ours. We like to sit uh, like this, and some are just uh, uh, on, the, on the ground level. That is also according to tradition here. I would just here um, put the attention to, I showed you before that some countries has this level of sanitation and so on, but it's not like that. I mean, if you look at world level, 14%, this is about um, uh, open defecation prevalence. That is made using the bushes. We're not counting the shared latrines. We're not counting latrines that are not clean. Those going to the bushes, 14% of the world population is doing that. And if you look at the Southern Asia, you can get some average ideas from Southern Asian, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeastern Asia, Northern Africa, and so on. And if you look at the countries and so on. But if you go into the country like Mozambique here, you can see there's a difference between the rural areas and there's a difference between the urban areas. So the rural areas has 51% of people going there. Urban areas have only 15 people, percent of people going to the bushes. But even in the rural areas, you can see such a big difference in a village here. If you look at the average of the richest 20% in a village, in a, uh, then the, it's only 13% that is practicing uh, open defecation, while 96% of the poor people in, 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 a, in the rural areas they are practicing open defecation. So there's a, just a big difference between people. We cannot say that average is this, that we need to treat everyone uh, like they were following that rule. It's very big difference, um, even within rural areas here. I'll finish off by um, saying a few things about what I have been able to see is going on in the discussions about what to do after 2015. As I said, we had these Millennium Development Goals, they also called the 2015 Goals. But now, UN is discussing in many places. UNDP is kind of leading the discussion, but there's also a lot of working groups uh, involved in discussing what, what, are, what is our next goals going to be. Probably they will be called Sustainable Development Goals. Instead of Millennium Development Goals, they are called now Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, they have a working group in the UN. They're also doing national consultations. They are trying really to get people involved. It's not in our countries, but it's in, in developing countries. 
uh, where they try to get people involved, you know, to find out what are the problems that we're going to focus on here. There's an, a world survey where you can go and give your own opinion of what you think is the most important issues to work with. Uh, so they are trying, UN is trying to collect some data from that. And then, possibly, but I haven't been able to confirm it, there's going to be a summit in, in September uh, this year where every all the countries are meeting and probably deciding on something new. I have the impression from reading uh, on the internet that the process is very difficult, very difficult to get to it. There's a list of uh, 168 targets for the moment that they would like to boil down to something more uh, uh, more manageable. But looking pre precisely at the water and sanitation and hygiene area here, the uh, joint monitoring program that was UNICEF and, and WHO, they have working groups with people from uh, 60 countries and uh, they have boiled it down for the moment to to, to this, uh, these suggestions, which is also saying something that we have to look into some details here. They want to eliminate open defecation. It's turned out that open defecation more and more is becoming the, the devil in this. We, we talked from 2000 when they made the goals, we said there is adequate sanitation and there's inadequate sanitation. But now they're saying, okay, among the inadequate sanitation, open defecation is really bad. That has to be eliminated totally. So let's focus on that and then accept some of the less uh, good sanitation options instead here. So they want to... Uh, to yes? the, the river, the train in India, is it open? No, it's an unhygienic defecation. It would be called unhygienic. It is a construction after all. But the result is the same in terms of uh, pollution, you would say. So they say they want to achieve universal access to basic drinking water, sanitation, hygiene for households, schools, and healthcare systems. And this basic is apparently not uh, good quality necessarily, but at least some basic. You don't have to walk uh, 10 kilometers to get your water. Uh, you don't need to walk very far to find a toilet and so on. And then again, they want, again, they, they say we cannot reach the total goals. They put again this like half the proportion of population without access at home to safely manage drinking water and sanitation. So this is talking about safe uh, access at home. We, we want more people. We, it's not very good about this shared latrine, but everybody should have a shared latrine, but more people should have access at home. And then they say progressively eliminate inequalities in access. And that is about the <clears throat> difference between urban and rural, between rich and poor, and, and, and so on. Good.